It is so far. So it's time to start our forum this afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Ivy Nichols. I'm chair of the Southwest Wisconsin Technical College District Board. And as you know, we are here today to meet one of the finalists in our search for the president. The search process began in November with a nationwide search and has been narrowed down to three finalists. The candidate who is with us here today was selected from a field of applicants from around the country. And before I introduce our applicant, I will once again introduce our board because we have board members here as well. So again, wave your hand. Jim Kohlenberg, Chris Pragy, Rhonda Sutton, Missy Fitzsimmons, Darlene Nicholson, Diane Messer, and Russ Royer, who was here yesterday, but he snuck it over there. <laughs> so, Dr. Jason Wood has served as Executive Vice President for Student and Academic Services at Central Wyoming College, which is located in Riverton, Wyoming, since July of 2012. Central Wyoming College serves over 2,200 students and has one campus, provides online and other distance delivered courses, and has four outreach centers. Other positions Dr. Wood has held at Central Wyoming College include Vice President for Academic Services and Interim Director of Human Resources. Dr. Wood earned a PhD in Community College Leadership from Oregon State University a Master of Education degree in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Idaho, and a Bachelor of Art in Spanish with a minor in History from Brigham Young University. Jason Wood's academic career began with teaching Spanish and culture at a missionary training center in Utah, followed by teaching high school Spanish and history and coaching basketball in, a rural, north, in rural North Idaho. Dr. Wood has experience in higher education as a recruitment coordinator, senior director of college preparation, college dean, and as a dean for student services at colleges in the Northwest and Western United States. Under Dr. Wood's direction, Central Wyoming College has experienced an increase in course completion rates, student academic progress, and satisfactory academic progress for financial aid eligible students. Dr. Wood leads the college-wide student success initiative, new academic program development, has aided in the transition to a statewide performance funding model, oversees the writing of federal and state grants, and is leading the Central Wyoming's College's Higher Learning Commission Persistence and Completion Academy. Dr. Wood was appointed by the Wyoming governor to serve on Complete College America, and the Professional Standards Teaching Board. He was also appointed by the Oregon Governor to the Student Pathways to Success Steering Committee. Jason Wood has served as a Peer Assurance Evaluator in Open Pathways for the Higher Learning Commission and as a Peer Evaluator for the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. He has extensive experience working with K-12 partners creating learning communities that link academic courses with local employers, developing and teaching service learning curriculum to enhance academic content of a course while connecting community partners, and leading efforts to secure over $7 million in new grant funding over the last four years. Dr. Wood has been involved in multiple community service organizations and activities including Kiwanis, Boy Scouts, Adopt a Highway, homeless coalitions, and youth drug-free communities. He has served on boards for a Health Foundation, an Information Technology Advisory Committee, and a Regional Tourism Advocacy Organization. Dr. Wood is joined today by his wife, Catherine, and daughter, Heidi. Dr. Wood has allowed me to share with you the pictures that you see on the screen. He has six daughters. And Dr. Wood is very proud of his daughters and their diverse set of talents and abilities. His oldest daughters, in order of their age, play the harp, flute, violin, and cello. On the other side of the spectrum, Natalie, his oldest daughter, 
shot a 10-point white-tailed deer last fall. This forum is designed to afford Dr. Wood an opportunity to meet with you and discuss issues relevant to his background and experience, as well as the future of Southwest Tech. It will be my task today to keep these proceedings on track and on time, as well as to, as to ensure that our discussions focus on the President leadership profile, Dr. Wood's education and experience as related to the mission and vision of Southwest Tech, as well as the future of the college. We will start this forum with a short presentation by Dr. Wood. Thereafter, I will be asking questions previously submitted by the Southwest Tech community at large. Dr. Wood will answer questions as long as we have available time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Wood, who will start with a few comments. the biography. Um, I'm excited to be here. I do need to mention my daughters, the three oldest daughters, just competed in the Stars of Tomorrow competition, playing the harp, flute, and violin, and each of them placed first in their divisions. So, that was a pretty good accomplishment. And Heidi's here. Yeah. I'm interviewing on April Fool's Day. Um, <laughs> The irony of that has struck me a number of times, but you know, I, I snuck out here to Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago and I got an inkling that I, I might be a finalist. Uh, walked around campus with a t-shirt and a baseball hat, just tried to observe and get a feel for the area, snuck around the communities a little bit. I noticed a couple of things about Wisconsin. <coughs> Cows and corn. Um, we have cattle in Wyoming, but they're a little bit different. Uh, we have longhorns, quite a few of them. And it's a metaphor for my presentation today. As I move from point to point, there may be a whole lot of bull in between. <laughs> Hallmarks of who I am and what I do professionally, I, I really like to create a culture where innovation can thrive and, and it leads to excellence. And most importantly, I think that's for students. And then I think second, that's for the communities we serve. Uh, my background, which was already covered, I started off coaching high school basketball. Absolutely loved doing that. Um, and while I was teaching, what wasn't mentioned is I was also a full-time custodian during the summers. And in that capacity, uh, I learned a great deal about the facilities, but made some really strong connections and relationships with other custodians who enhanced what I was able to do in the classroom. So I think as president of a college, it would give me an opportunity to recognize that everyone at the college is here to serve students and help them be successful. And then later on, it was mentioned that I was the interim HR director. Um, I know you have a brand new HR director, five or six weeks on the job. Um, I admire HR. I do. They, they work in sometimes very difficult compliance situations and very much appreciate the work they do. But on, on the right side, uh, some of the things that I focused on, I was able to write a grant when I was at Klamath Community College to start a, a TRIO program. They didn't have one. It was a newer college. Provided uh, one, a little over a million dollars to help students that were first generation, low income, or had disabilities, and made a big difference in their success. Uh, we also started a student government there at that college, and that was exciting to be a part of. When I was in Brookings at Southwest Oregon Community College, we opened a brand new branch campus. I was able to facilitate a land donation of 20 acres. It was a beautiful ocean view property right on the coast, and there's now a 25,000 square foot building there. But it was very invigorating to work with um, the company that donated the land, to work with city administrators, to extend facilities and work with the legislature to get an appropriation for the facility, uh, something I very much enjoyed. In my current position, uh, let's see, how did I organize this? Some of the things that have happened on the innovative side, everyone does strategic planning. I think one of the things that we do that, that I bring to that process is we make sure our strategic plan is a daily document. It guides what we do on a regular basis. Um, we, we address it in our governance meetings. It's something we talk about in department meetings. Uh, and it's revisited all the time. And as data comes in, we adjust 
and, and move that forward. Uh, we also link it to the budget, and rather than come up with money later that might be spent on strategic priorities, we develop our strategic priorities and then look at how we're going to fund those through the budget process. And another unique thing about that, I know there's college committees on campus. Every college has them. Um, we spend a lot of time in committee meetings, sometimes too much. We empower our committees with funding. They have charges that are important, that are strategic. And so, for example, our diversity committee has a $25,000 budget to carry out their charges. And that's very empowering for employees to be able to make the decisions and do the things they need to do to accomplish their tasks. Um, I, I've been instrumental in getting several legislative appropriations from capital construction projects to funding for salary for employees. Uh, to base funding for community colleges. I get to work very closely in my current role uh, with le legislators to help move the college forward. It's something I enjoy. We've been pretty successful at uh, getting funding support at the state level. Um, Co-curricular learning. We believe that learning happens outside of the classroom as well as inside the classroom. Co-curricular learning was an initiative that's particularly relevant to Southwest Tech as a technical college because now in our general education curriculum we require all students to gain some sort of professional experience as a degree requirement. So in order to get that co-curricular credit they have to work closely with a faculty advisor to design, implement, and carry out um, a professional development opportunity while they're undergraduates. Uh, so that's an exciting initiative. I don't know of any other college in the country that's doing it. And the University of Wyoming has been so pleased with what we've accomplished that it's now fitting into their gen ed requirements as they transfer and they're looking to us and to our students uh, as models. Uh, the last three are programs that we've started uh, under my leadership, the entrepreneurship program, simulation technology and geospatial information systems. Those are all technical programs that lead to jobs. Uh, we got a grant for one of them, it was a, a pre-hire grant, so our local businesses came together and said, we need two employees, and another business said, we've got five employees that could use that training. So we wrote the grant uh, with 50 or 60 partners that committed to hiring graduates, and that grant was outside funding that then comes in and provides the training, and those students have jobs when they successfully complete the program in geospatial information systems. And I was amazed at going through that process at how many different employers are looking at using GIS technology. Uh, city administrators are looking to uh, fill potholes and they can do their studies on where they need to, to do that and at what time and, and how often. Uh, the simulation technology is a program that's being developed with funding from the Gates Foundation. Um, it's a competency-based program which I think also speaks to technical colleges. Uh, rather than worry about the credit hours and how long students are sitting in gen ed classes, it's about how proficient they become with the skills that are necessary to be hired in that field. And it links those students that work as IT tech people in our nursing simulation lab uh, with jobs across other industry spectrums. So very exciting. And then I'll just note a couple of the successes we've had. Uh, Every year that, that I've been at uh, CWC, our enrollment success rate has improved. Um, that's the single mechanism that's used for performance-based funding in Wyoming. And I know Wisconsin has gone to some level of performance-based funding, and you've fared very well in that. But I think there's still some opportunity to define uh, what other success factors are going to be calculated uh, and how that money will be distributed. But it's good to do well at what they pay for, and that's one of the things that, that we hang our hat on. Satisfactory academic progress was mentioned. Our students uh, went from 54% to 76%. Um, we've done similar to you guys. This campus has been transformed. I, I wasn't here when the bond passed, but taking the tour of campus, you realize how much of the space has really transformed what you do uh, with the new buildings and, and the remodels that have happened. That's, very similar to what we've gone through. And I think more importantly than the footprint that's changed, what happens in those spaces. And I was particularly impressed walking around campus with the innovative and unique um, spaces that faculty have taken ownership of and made their own. As you walk into classrooms, uh, 
Let's see, was the IT tech classroom? I mean, that just screams technology. It's a techie playground uh, for those students, and that's good to see. Um, and there were a number of other facilities that, that were just very specialized and certainly uh, faculty influenced, and I think that's important in any learning environment. Our nursing students, uh, we struggled with our retention rates would be high, and then our pass rates of the nursing exam would be low, and then our retention rates would go down, and our pass rates would go up. This last year, we retained 88% of the nurses who started the program, and 100% of them passed the licensure exam on the first try. And so that's what, what I um, really enjoy striving for success and helping people be successful in what they want to bring forward. Our writing, uh, I'm going to go through this real quickly so we can get to the questions, but our developmental writing students, uh, they're taking pre-college writing, only 30% of them were passing college level writing. So we sent our faculty on research projects uh, all over the country to find out what's working. They came back, designed what would work for them, and after two years, this is two years of data, um, it's held pretty steady, our college developmental writing students take their college level writing at the same time, and the idea is no longer that uh, if you're deficient, um, you have to go back and get the building blocks and move forward. We teach at the college level, and we expect students to write at the college level, and when they don't, they rewrite, and they work closely with the faculty to understand what they can do better. So we, we change how we taught and how we view teaching, and the faculty drove that process. 75% of the students that come into our developmental writing pass college level writing in the same semester, their first semester that they're there. Talk about saving students time and money and getting them into programs where writing is no longer a concern because they can write at the college level. That's what I get excited about helping to make that happen. And then I know you guys, a pride point, um, your retention rates are really high, your graduation rates are high, you outperform uh, most of the colleges in the country. Uh, you take great pride in your local high school students having Southwest Tech as a, a place of priority. I think 25 to 28 percent is the number that I come across of your graduating seniors come here. Um, we've worked really hard at those relationships with our high schools because we're experiencing the same thing you are declining high school enrollments for the next five or seven years. Your graduating classes get smaller and smaller. Um, we had 50% of Riverton High School come to CWC last year, 50% of the graduating class. Um, and we've, we've just had a variety of initiatives that have led to that. But I have the firm belief that it takes a campus to help students be successful. So our housing, student, our housing employees that work in housing, for example, came up with the idea that it's probably more cost effective to offer free summer housing in the summer when it sits empty than to have the dorms sit empty. So we attach success to students getting free summer housing. And if they complete nine credits during the summer successfully, they don't have to pay their housing bill. And so that was an initiative that came up through the ranks of our housing employees that was embraced across campus and went to scale and made an impact. Um, and I think when you develop relationships with those that are inside the classroom and those that are outside the classroom, uh, amazing things can happen on campus. So that's a little bit about my background. I will say all of the strategies I've ever come across are not nearly as important as the culture of the college. How we interact with each other, how we work together, what we value is more important than any strategy we have on paper. So when I'm asked what my leadership style is, I really do emphasize uh, those soft skills that value people and help us develop relationships and, and move forward working in an atmosphere of respect and trust. Uh, culture trumps strategy. I didn't coin that. that I, I don't even know who was first, but um, I'm a big believer in that. And I have a video that we weren't able to get to work traditionally, so we're going to go this route. सर आपके लिए उस पार कार का इंतजाम किया है सर सर 
ahí es el piso. Eh, eh, tal, tal. Vale. Ya, 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 कुछ करो ना मैं वहां जाके क्या उखाड़ लूंगा कैसी जाने बूंदे आई जाने कैसा दर्द लाई सामने क्या है ये तेरे क्यों रुका है तू बता रे हो तुझको पार लेगा कौन होगा वो मसीहा वो जिसे तू ढूंढता है वो ही है तू तू वही है तुझ में तेरा रास्ता है तुझ में तेरा है सहारा तुझको पार लेगा तू ही है तेरा किनारा तुझ में तेरा रास्ता है तुझ में तेरा है सहारा तू ही तुझको पार लेगा तू ही है तेरा So with that, I, I think where I do well and where I draw my energy is bringing people together to remove barriers that, that help others be successful. What I enjoy doing. I have a tremendous Hi, amount of. Hi, guys. Whoa. Oh, <laughs> I may have just lost the job, right? There. <laughs> that was not on my computer. <laughs> I don't know. I'll answer some questions. We'll see if I can get back to it. <laughs> so much for going to YouTube. Thank you for your comments. All right. Ten questions. First, what factors were used in your decision to apply at Southwest Tech? That, that's a great question. Why, why did I to apply here. Um, well, one, I'm, I'm looking for jobs, and so I was on the market. Uh, last spring, I'll just briefly mention, I was the runner-up for the presidency at my current college. Uh, the president had been there for 40 years, 25 as president, um, and it was no secret I was being groomed um, for a presidency and had pr promotions that expanded my responsibilities, and they hired somebody else. The board voted 4-3 to hire someone with presidential experience and fundraising experience, and I, I didn't have those, and I was bitterly disappointed, I, I will be very honest. It was heartbreaking, um, but I supported the board's decision. Uh, when the board speaks, I, I believe it's of the utmost importance to carry out uh, those, des those desires. They represent the community who we serve, and I think that there's a sacred trust there. Um, so I helped transition the new president to the college, and then about Christmas time, uh, worked with him to, we, we had a very amicable conversation, and I decided to look for presidencies, and they're going to restructure my position to just a VP, and uh, they'll move forward, and I'll move forward. And I found Southwest Tech, um, I'm, I'm drawn to your strategic plan, the initiatives that you've got underway, or some, some of them are things that we've had a lot of success with, that I think I can add value here. Uh, some of them are new and innovative that I've never heard of, and I'd like to be a part of. Um, I'm drawn to small rural towns. If you look at my career, I, I've always been in small towns, and, and that is purposeful, and I don't ever want to go to a big city. Um, I enjoy the advantages of small towns, and I accept some of the disadvantages that we have, but it's an environment I like to work in. Um, 
And then I, I, I've been naturally drawn to the, the professional technical side of our college and some of the things we can accomplish with local partnerships and employers. Uh, and that's, that's who you are, that's 90% of what you do. Ours is 50-50. Um, and so all of those things weighed in your favor and then I snuck out here and got a peek and we came out yesterday and trying to get to know people and hoping it's a match. How is a technical college unique from a community college and a four-year university college? And what is the role of general education in a technical college? Multi-part question. I think the technical component uh, was very evident in the tour. Very specialized spaces that, uh, depending on the degree, sometimes you see at universities, and that's a similarity, but you see it in the advanced graduate programs. Students at technical colleges get to use that almost day one. We have a radio production program, and our students are on the air the first day in classes. That's one of the most important things for our, our faculty member leading that program. And any of the programs have, have a tremendous emphasis on hands-on learning. Do it, get, get dirty, get busy, get involved, experience what it is and learn from that. Uh, I'm drawn to that. That's, what I've brought to our current college with the co-curricular learning initiative. The other components that are in our co-curricular were uh, the professional experience, cultural diversity, and, and civic engagement. Um, so I think that there's a role for general education in any tech area. Um, as you go into the workforce and you work in those areas, uh, I think a general education can expand your ability to think critically. I think it expands your influence in the community and your opportunity to partner outside of your chosen profession, and those are skills that are increasingly important. But if you've sat in a classroom and had experience with folks that are going into all different areas, I think you become a more employable and better asset. And then the final difference um, between universities, uh, I think universities are starting to realize the value in technical transfer programs, and you're seeing uh, applied baccalaureate degrees, and you're seeing community colleges offer those applied baccalaureates and partnerships with universities um, that are exciting. And with how fast things are changing, I think that continued education is a key part. And what we do in community and technical colleges with customized training is a key part of what I think universities wish they could do. And that's be adaptable, flexible, and very applied to the partners that are in their area. Um, and then the last part of your question, did I get to the general ed philosophy a little bit? I'm getting sort of nods. Maybe I got a B minus on that question. <laughs> Please outline what you believe are the three most important roles or responsibilities of the president of a technical college. The three more most important roles of a president. So I'll say first and foremost, it's establishing a culture. Um, and working with the college to define what that culture is going to be. Any transition of this magnitude brings a great deal of change, and there's anxiety, in, and it manifests itself in all different ways. There's anxiety in the community. Uh, it's an opportunity, but I think there's also some threats. And so I think that first and foremost, it's the president's responsibility to understand the heart and soul of the college. What's happening, what's going on, how do we emphasize who we want to be and how we want to conduct our business, um, and that, that should be a top priority. How we treat each other, how we interact in the community, how we serve students. Um, emphasizing culture would be a top priority. Uh, two, um, reporting to a board. The board has fiduciary responsibility for the college. I think uh, how you finance and budget and invest is a key component of what the upper administration does at the college and the president's that liaison with the board of chair and, and the board and, and those um, working to make those decisions. And I also think that it's a president's responsibility in today's age to find more money, quite frankly. Use the resources we have better and more, efficiency, more efficiently, but also lead the charge on grants or partnerships or fundraising or work with the foundation that's a, a sister organization to the college to find new ways uh, to do better and be more efficient. And then finally, this may be a little bit different, catch a few people by surprise, but I, th I think a top priority for the president should be listening. I think the president needs to be someone 
who can hear everywhere. And everywhere they go, pay attention to what's being said about the college indirectly, and a place where people can come directly and give very succinct and direct feedback. Uh, here's what's going well, here's what's not going well. Uh, I have a very open door policy, students, faculty, staff, and community. Um, and I take that responsibility to be a good listener seriously. So those would be my three. <clears throat> Please clarify your philosophy of leadership and management. Please describe your typical leadership and management styles, particularly in reference to the most important responsibilities of a president. <laughs> Should I cite my sources? <laughs> wow. So, philosophy on leadership and, on management. Leadership and management, and describe your typical management leadership style. I, I think leadership happens at a couple of levels. First and foremost, you lead by action, by doing. Um, I, I like the video because it does portray someone who provided leadership that you didn't necessarily expect to do it. Um, the little boy stepped up and started trying to get it done. And if we're going to do an internal college fundraising campaign and ask employees to donate to the college, the college president should lead in that effort in a visible way. I'm not comfortable with the visible side necessarily, but the office of the president should have that responsibility. Uh, so I, I think from a philosophy standpoint, you lead by example. Um, I subscribe to the servant leadership role. Um, I don't take it lightly at lunch. You know, just for purposes of the job interview, I'll, I'll talk about this. At lunch, I have no problem clearing the, the plates of anyone else in the room. It doesn't matter who they are. And I do that regularly at, at, any, at any function, regardless of my title. Um, and I also think that as leaders, uh, we need to be aware of the human aspect that everyone brings to work. There's things that influence us outside of work. There's things that motivate us inside of work. And so from a philosophy standpoint, getting to know people and what motivates and drives them uh, helps make decisions and helps make that process of engaging people uh, a lot more effective. Uh, the last part of the question was management. Mm -hmm. The second part, I, I do believe management is completely different. You don't manage people. Um, you can meet deadlines. I am not a hands-on micromanager by any stretch of the imagination. There's no way I can be. With the successes we've had, those should be attributed to uh, a number of individuals. Uh, and I think as managers, we need to remember that the priority is people first, which is leadership, and then our tasks and responsibilities second, which fall under the management category. Did I answer the question? Okay. <laughs> Please describe for us, or define for us, excuse me, the desired scope and content of a strategic <coughs> plan, and describe your preferred process for preparing, implementing, and assessing the success of a strategic plan. Okay, and I totally forgot your last question of linking that to the three priorities, so I just realized that. Strategic planning, um, there's a number of theories out there. You can read the textbooks, you can have different models. Uh, you can have beautiful strategic plans that are in nice binders and everything else. And I, I don't buy into that at all. Um, the format for me is less important. Uh, it's the fact that people are engaged in developing it. Um, we changed how we do in-services in our college so that people can be engaged rather than coming and listening to the administration give state of the college addresses. Uh, we talked about, we, we did a SWOT analysis as a college. Uh, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? You've done that with the Noel Levitt's employee survey. You've got some real concrete things that you can latch on and, and do. I think from a strategic planning standpoint, that's where all the good ideas are prioritized into an action document. And that action document should drive committee charges. If you've got a committee operating off on its own, um, there can be a lot of inefficiencies which lead to employees feeling either disengaged or unable to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish. And so bringing those all together uh, is a key part of what I call strategic planning. Our strategic plan, um, the, the committees have charges that are directly related to what we want to accomplish as a strategic plan. 
And so if you go on campus, people may not know exactly which priority they're working on or accomplishing, but they know that the work they're doing is important, it's related, it's moving us forward, um, and there's some resources behind it to accomplish that. So I, I'm very familiar with all sorts of different models of strategic planning. I'm comfortable working with any of them. But more importantly, I think it, you've got to get people engaged and you've got to keep it on track. I don't know how many times you've had, we've had a strategic initiative that's a great idea and we've maybe piloted a component of it or talked about this a little bit, but it never gets clear through. And, and that's where I do a pretty good job of seeing things through, um, analyzing on the back end, assessing how it went, making adjustments, and coming back and taking it to the next step. I don't believe a strategic plan is a five-year plan. You may have goals that are five years out that you're working towards, but they need to be reevaluated on a regular basis. And the more people you can get involved, I found that there's more people that want to be involved than actually get an opportunity. And so sometimes you've got to restructure the things you do as a college, uh, and that's where how you use your in-service and staff development time come into play. So a huge believer in strategic plan, and I'm driven by the mission and vision uh, of the college. That, that's what, at the end of the day, we're supposed to be doing. And as a president, that's what I would emphasize. The culture of an organization is deeply embedded and develops over years, not months. Given the major changes of Act 10 and the impact of that change on the organization, what steps would you propose to take to build a more cohesive, positive workplace at Southwest Tech? Act 10. I am post-Act 10. Um, so I have a completely clear slate on what that may have meant in the past, what it means now that it's no longer, or uh, you know, now that it's implemented and your um, unions have a completely different role and it's being redefined across the state. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm not going to have the answers as far as an expert of what it was and what, what the uh, legislative legislation was intended to do. Uh, which is going to require me to lean on that listening. Who were you? What was important? What can we keep? Where are we going moving forward? How do we still show that we value employees? I've worked in union environments in, as a teacher, and then in Oregon as an administrator. I chaired the... <laughs> I didn't do that either. <laughs> I've chaired bargaining teams for the college uh, to negotiate contracts. Um, and, and I've seen what can happen when you have uh, bad administrators or you have bad faculty representatives. And I think the principles apply regardless of the environment. So whether, whether there is or isn't a union, whatever the legislation is intended to do, our disagreements on what it was intended to do, uh, you're going to find someone that's going to spend a great deal of the first six months, 12 months listening to those perspectives. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I think my track record shows a tremendous investment in employees. Uh, going to the legislature and actually securing base salary increases directly from the legislature for our employees at our college uh, was a huge accomplishment. Um, getting base funding from the legislature, not only did they not cut money, but they invested in community colleges and our base funding. Uh, that's then money that we can use to invest back in our employees. Every year I've been there, we've invested in, in base salary increases, uh, and we recognize our, our most important resources are people. So as far as the legislation goes, I'm not an expert. Um, if you're looking for someone that knows the ins and outs in history, um, there's two other candidates that are probably much more qualified, well, without a doubt, more qualified in those areas. Um, but my approach would be to, to, find out, to find out more from the perspective of those who have lived it, and then try and find some common ground on where we can go given that reality. Uh, so. Considering the decline of the district area's population and the fact that full-time equivalencies are a factor in the funding in, of Wisconsin Technical Colleges, how would you address the need to increase or at least maintain current levels of FTE students at Southwest Tech? Yeah, that's been the heart of what I've done ever since I've been in community colleges. When I started, it was as a recruitment coordinator. And my job was to find more students. And everywhere I've gone, regardless of the job title, uh, that's been the name of the game. Uh, 
a couple of ground rules on that for me. You, you can never sacrifice academic integrity for enrollments, um, ever, ever, under any circumstance. You cease to be a college if you lower your standards. Um, I think by very definition of higher learning, academic integrity and quality is what keeps students and helps keep our the, the people who hire our students or receive our students into the universities. Um, and so we're, we're very insistent that any recruitment plan is twofold, recruitment of students and retention of students and maintaining high standards. Uh, very diverse set of initiatives that we've implemented, I could talk about them. One of the ones that was most rewarding was our adopt a high school plan when I was a college recruiter. And that was, you know, we have, and it's very similar to here. Uh, people work all over the service district and commute to campus. Uh, we found that they often have very good relationships in their local schools, whether it's elementary, middle school, or high schools. And they're phenomenal ambassadors for the college because they know the teachers, the advisors, uh, the kids in class, sometimes they're over at their home. And so when we recognized and gave release time to stop at high school, our employees jumped at that opportunity. What do you mean the president's not going to show up and give out the scholarship? Well, the president's going to go and introduce the teacher or the faculty member or the financial aid representative, but that financial aid representative gets to stand up and give their next door neighbor a scholarship to come to college. Uh, so from a recruitment standpoint, I think you reach out, redefine everyone's role in, in recruiting. Um, our faculty uh, just put in their job descriptions through a process, all faculty are responsible for doing recruitment. Um, that was something they came up with. They wanted the college to recognize that they're some of our best recruiters. When a, high, when a college faculty member can link with a high school teacher and do a science demonstration with college students and high school students, what a phenomenal opportunity for those students to then see the value of coming to college. Um, I, and I've got a ton of ideas, and I'm sure you have a lot of ideas. I, I think at the end of the day, from an enrollment standpoint and boosting FTEs, it's part of the conversation, um, but I'm very, very careful to say it's not simply about numbers and seats. We've got to redefine um, seat time and have that be the variable and learning be the constant. Um, I'm working on a couple of national organizations and uh, invited to publish a, a book that's coming out this summer on that very concept. Seat time can be variable. If you learn something quicker, do you really need to sit through the rest of the semester if you're doing it at a higher level than expected? And if not, is there something we can give you next? Um, and it works really well in the trade pro in the technical programs, the competency-based learning. So I'd, I'd be excited to have those conversations and see how it influences recruitment. In light of uh, the budget challenges, what role should the Southwest Tech president play to promote the college with state and federal legislators and external donors and describe your experience in these areas? Very good. Uh, president should be enthusiastic and passionate about what's being accomplished at the college. They, they need to be able to go into any environment and talk to a legislator and let them know, here's what we're doing well in your hometown college. You also need to be able to talk to other people that you might have common interests with uh, in other service districts and work with college officials from those colleges. Um, I had no contacts in Wyoming before we moved there. It was an adventure for us to go there. No family, no friends. We came into it new. We were going to spend the rest of our lives there. And that's how I would operate coming into this position if I was successful. So building those relationships with legislatures, legislators for me has been about what do they need to help them be successful and how do we work in the college as a solution to that success. Uh, for example, our legislators were getting bombarded locally with the lack of qualified nurses. Um, and, and that's where the whole idea of our health and science building and expanding our nursing program came from. But once we started to give them an idea of what it would cost and how we could do it, they realized that that was an investment they couldn't afford not to make. Um, but if you're not passionate and enthusiastic about it, um, and everywhere, you, I mean, you literally need to be everywhere, uh, you're not going to get the message out. And the last piece to that, 
and I think more importantly than the others, when things go bad, you got to tell the truth. You've got to be very open and honest when perhaps a program's not performing very well. Uh, because the last thing people who are investing in you like is to hear that you didn't fully disclose something and they were giving money to something that they would not have invested in otherwise. And I found that those folks, through some very difficult experiences, uh, um, I won't go into the details, but some very difficult experiences when we were upfront and honest with them, even though it was a very difficult situation, they came back even stronger investors in who we are and what we do. And, and that's not always easy. So I, I think from a communication and, and building a network standpoint, um, you've got to be open and honest with what you're doing well, as well as what's not going well. And when things aren't going well, that's when you step in with a solution. It's not just simply reporting, you know, our auto program only has a 5% graduation rate. We really hope it gets better. Uh, that's not going to establish any confidence in investors either. But talking to folks in the industry that can help bring it up. Um, anyway, you get, you get the picture. I, I really do think that uh, building those relationships and being of service to those who are in position uh, to support the college are key. And, you know, I'll just lean on my track record in that regard to what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, and I'll, I'll be the first to say I have no formal fundraising experience. Um, you're not hiring a fundraiser. It cost me a job last year. If it cost me another one, and, you know, it's a job. But um, my, my dissertation was on rural community college fundraising. And I really do believe that if given the chance, establishing relationships with students and understanding what motivates them and being in the community, you'll position yourselves well for all types of donations, not just the cash donations, but land, in-kind donation, legal services of our students that go on and get law degrees, what investment strategies, whatever that may be, establishing the relationships now pays off down the road. Um, and I'm excited about the opportunity to work in that environment, uh, but I don't have any, no direct fundraising experience. <clears throat> Please outline initiatives that you have undertaken to ensure or improve student access and success? Again, that's who I am and what we do. I, mean, if I, I can think of lots. I'll go back a ways. When, when I was overseeing the English as a Second Language program, uh, some of our school districts, it was a huge service district, 27,000 square miles, 25 school districts, very rural and remote in, in Oregon. Some of our K-12 school districts were uh, more than 50% Spanish speaking as a first language. Uh, and many of the students, their parents didn't speak any English. And for that matter, I think it was about 20% of the students didn't speak any English and they were learning English by immersion. Um, so their parents certainly weren't in a position to be what we would traditionally think of as possible college students. Uh, we wrote a grant uh, through the federal Title II funds to start um, a civics program for non-native English speakers. And what we chose to do was work in, in partnership with the school districts. And I worked very closely with superintendents and principals. Uh, they were noticing large achievement gaps in this population in terms of their standardized testing. Um, very little support from home. And I'm bilingual Spanish and had some inns in, in, in those communities. So we, we went door to door and talked to parents. How can, how can we help you help your kids? Um, and I started student ambassadors at that college and nine of the 12 student ambassadors were Hispanic and they'd go with me and we'd get into some homes and have amazing conversations. Long story short, we set up a program where the students got funding to have supplemental instruction in hands-on learning environment, they got computers, it was really cool stuff for kids. A meal was provided in the evenings, and we took the parents during that time. Child care for those that are too small to benefit from the instruction. And so ultimately, we had an environment where the adults were getting English as a second language training, and the, we contextualized the learning. In other words, 
They were learning how to conduct a parent-teacher conference. How do I read this no poem from the teacher that talks about what the student's going to be doing? It's in English. And then how do I go to a parent-teacher conference and have a conversation with someone that doesn't speak my language? And so we, we did that for three months. Um, and through a program, through immersion and really focusing on that, at the end, they held real parent-teacher conferences. And it was in English. And the parents were able to get something out of it and communicate back and forth. Um, and it, it, it was exciting to see, but at the end of the day, uh, how that benefited those students in our ESL program is they were then able to get into uh, teacher aid, uh, what, what do they call it? Teacher assistance. Um, and we had a college program. It was just a certificate. It was a one semester certificate, but it got them benefited jobs at the, col at the, high, at the elementary schools doing reading. Uh, and that. And, and so it led a population that otherwise never would have gone to college, helped their kids prepare and be successful in elementary school, and then they were able to enroll in that paraeducator program. And we had, I think, eight, at the first cohort, 18 of the 20 parents graduated. Um, and all of them were employed by the school districts. And, and so, you know, there's been a number of those across my career. That's one that. Um, I'm extremely proud of. We got it on grant money and it led to increased FTEs and graduation and student success. But it was a population that otherwise never would have gone to college, ever. Uh, and I have no doubt of that. I have about eight minutes. How many questions do I have? We have one more. Look at that. <laughs> All the bubbles, the girls talking on the computer. I'm going to at least meet the deadline. <laughs> Please describe the workforce issues that will impact the Southwest Wisconsin District over the foreseeable future, and how you will guide the college to address the workforce needs of employers. When I talk to employers, I'm amazed at their answer to this question. What is it you need most? And I, I'm just amazed that they say we need people to show up on time. Um, we, we need people that will come to work and not take a day off without permission. Um, we, we need folks, we can teach them a great deal, but they've got to be here. Same conversation with faculty. What concerns you most about students? Well, if my students would come to class, they'd get a lot out of class. Um, but attendance is an issue. The students that drop out don't go to class. The students that go to class tend to get pretty good grades and be successful and develop strong relationships. We're, we're having the same conversation with folks that I think we have the responsibility as a college to maybe change some of our policies. Should we, should we have, the, and it's one thing to ask the question. The question can bring us together for a conversation. I realize that, and the answers are gonna drive us in all different directions, but the question is, should we have an attendance policy that's more like a job attendance policy. You know, what happens if you show up five minutes late to today's lecture? Is administration going to support the faculty member saying, like a boss would say, strike one? Um, what happens if the student does that repeatedly? Do they get fired from college? Or are we okay accepting their money knowing they're going to fail? Um, administratively, we'll lose FTEs the first year or two we do this. Um, but I think the conversation is a critical conversation to have and bring a college together on how you solve it. Because from an employer standpoint, we know we're effective when our students graduate. Employers, and I've read your, your surveys, employers are very pleased with the product they're getting. Your hospitals employ a lot of your graduates. Um, if they'll go through the program and graduate, they're employable and they do good things. So how do we have that conversation before it even starts on some of those soft skills? And it's not just punctuality. Um, it's, why, it's why I've served some of my volunteer time uh, working in, to establish drug-free communities at, at the high school level. Um, you know, I ran Idaho Drug-Free Youth and trying to get kids to understand, boy, there's some employers that you've got to pass the test. And, well, what test is that? I mean, can I study for it? No, it's the cup test. I mean, there's, you just got to pass the cup test. And, <laughs> Um, they don't understand the consequences of their choices sometimes. And there's, there's some careers, criminal justice being one, that could, you can really limit your professional opportunities by some of the activities you get involved in. Uh, 
So long story short, I think um, the first thing is I think we need to align some of our academic policies with employability policies, attendance being the example I'll use. Uh, and I know that that's an extremely controversial conversation on campus. Um, but I think as a learning institution, we're smart enough to have that conversation, come up with a solution, um, and perhaps lead the country in, in being the solution. Second, uh, um, I think in working with the workforce, we, we've got to redefine learning um, and what we value and how we give credit and recognize. And, and that's the whole world of competency-based education. If we've got students that have spent a lifetime of balancing their checkbooks and working at a bank and they don't have a college degree, what competencies do they bring to college that would help them move into classes and not have to learn the same thing that they can already do really well. Uh, how, do you, how do you have testing for prior experience? Um, and I don't, I don't know what your policies are on those, but I know that they've been fascinating conversations when you get academic folks and employers talking about uh, where we'd like our workforce to go, and it's almost the same as where faculty want to take their programs. We just say it so differently that we can't translate. Uh, I asked one of our, we have an art program our college and I asked one of the faculty members, if you could build your art program from the ground up, how would you do it? And she knew me well enough to really dream with that. She came back and she said, if you're being serious, this is what I would do. Um, and she talked about creating art studios, and having your students go to competitions, and diving into all sorts of different mediums, and creating art. She even worked in how some of the gen eds could be accomplished in doing that. Um, and I said, so wait a second, you wouldn't say, okay, students, you need to complete 60 of these things we call credits. You get a credit by sitting in a classroom for an hour, three times a week, 15 weeks for a semester, and you need some in the humanities, and you need some in the sciences, and you need a math, and you need a writing, and you need a social science. She said, no. That's, but that's what college is. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, just in answering that question finally, that connection to the workforce through the um, advisory committees is fundamental. And we've re-energized our advisory committees rather than just having a specialized sit-down dinner with our nursing advisory committee and giving them the enrollment updates and testing passage rates. Uh, we've involved them with our strategic priorities. We want to recruit more students. We want to retain more students. How can you as employers help us do that? Uh, it's expanded our clinical space, it's brought in additional partners who bring revenue to the table and help us get pre-hire grants, um, and it's added to our faculty when they can have either a guest lecturer be more involved or an adjunct faculty uh, deliver uh, some specialized expertise. So I think to answer the question quickly, mm -hmm. as a tech college, that connection to the workforce you need to translate what you want back and forth. And when you start doing that, you'll find that there's a tremendous amount of similarities. And we are in a position to influence the habits of our students that will pay rewards when they're employed. Thank you, Dr. Wood, yes. Mrs. Wood, and Heidi for being here today. And thank you, students, faculty, staff, community members, for participating in this forum. Dr. Wood will be available until 3.30 to meet with you. Uh, there are cards available with a web address for your insights and comments, and we would appreciate it if you would complete those, and then that will be shared with the board. Please do that by Thursday at noon. And the videos of the three public forums will be available on the college website later today. So if you couldn't be here for all three, you have an opportunity to look at those. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Yes, thank you.